Uh, hello and welcome to the News from the Real World podcast. I'm Quinn. I'm Jess. I'm Eleanor. I'm Jody. Andrew. Andrew, back! Back from the... I saw you at the beginning of the term and now you're finally back. Yes, second to last one of the year. Good to have a new face. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, today we're starting it off with... <laughs> A pretty fluffy article uh, about the Twilight franchise. Has anybody seen those movies? <coughs> okay. no, I've yeah, I've seen the first. I've seen the first two. I've seen all five. Yeah. I think. Why? I think it's I've like, never seen one. You know, it's controversial in the feminist world, and you know, I just like to be up to date. Oh, what's that's going on. That's bullshit. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> or is it? I read all the books just so I could. That, attack them with my friends. Yeah, and right. she knows. Are you? Are you a Twilight? No, I hate it. Is, 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 it a, is it a popular franchise? Yeah. Extremely. Yeah. 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 Is that a real question? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, popular, I know it's popular, but does it actually make money and stuff? Or oh, is it, just... it makes tons of oh, money. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so tell us about this. Tell us about the Twilight Baby. Okay, see the freaky animatronic baby that almost invaded the Twilight franchise. This is from movies.com by Alison Natasi, and it's a student pick. Of course it's a student pick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those young kids, they love it. Really yeah. yeah. <laughs> Except Bobbers posted the article. Well, half of the mean, comments did start with, this is so creepy, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. yeah so. And it was creepy. Basically, the article was talking about how they're, for those of you who don't know, the, the main characters in Twilight have this baby that's half human, half vampire, and it's called Renesme. <laughs> I love that you know the name of the baby. Well, it's in the article, yeah. to be fair. And basically, this baby, when it's born, has like the body of a baby, but the eyes and the features of like an adult, and then right. it grows at like an exponential like rate. Like a full head of hair. Was anybody else <laughs> taken by that? Baby. Full yeah. head of hair. So how they, when they came to do the movie, they're like, "How are we going to do this? Let's make an animatronic like baby." And then that was just horrifying and yeah. distressing to all involved, so they CGI'd it. Did but yeah. in this video, you get to see the horrible animatronic baby, and you get to see one of the actors, Nicky Reed, I freaking out about really it. Really stupid. I can't believe really it made it past like, the developmental stages. Like, how could you actually make something this creepy and put it on film and think it was going to look And you know the thing must have cost an arm <laughs> I was just saying, did anybody, so like, wonder how much money yes. went into this? Did anyone cry at the thought of yeah. how much money went into this? Well, it's funny you mentioned the eyes, because that's what really gave it away. For me, the eyes were so inhuman, the way mm. they moved. They moved in such a digital way, such a like, mm -hmm. you know, a, a digitally controlled way that was just mm -hmm. such an obvious thing. I thought it, it so looked like the me. doll in The Conjuring. If I see The Conjuring, yes. it looked but like that doll. It just, the just, eyes. just yeah. to it as somebody who knows the plot behind Twilight. It's like she's she's written this thing of like it's a baby, but it has the features and the eyes of an adult. And conceptually, that kind of makes sense, but I can't even imagine what that would look like. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then they had to realize it, the poor people. I, so, I, I mean, feel like that's one of the places that you take a little liberty when yeah. you're taking a yeah. script from the well, I wish yeah. the article had put a so. picture of the CGI next to it. Yeah, so I don't know what the CGI would look like. like. Well, the CGI yeah. just kind of looks like a baby. It's, CGI. it's creepy. What are they? <laughs> <laughs> it's creepy. This Does like, the baby have hair? Like a full head no, of like Victorian no, doll no. style hair? No. You know that concept of the uncanny valley? Have you ever uh -huh. heard that, where yeah. the whole CGI thing, where the more human-like CGI looks, it actually looks stranger to us. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we, there's a there's a certain point that you reach where it's it's worse that it looks more human, <laughs> and this is kind of the opposite of that or something. It's like the uncanny mountain, you know. It's right. It's the uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> expecting that, and it's it's like I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what creeped me out, what's so creepy about that thing, and, like her little hands, and she kissed her hand in the video, yeah. did you see that? Yeah. And I could did just, I could chase the rubber in my mouth. <laughs> yeah. What would the readers think? Well, Hunter summed it up, the general feeling, with this simple sentence. This animatronic baby is horrifying. <laughs> and there you have All right, it. There we go. Alright, <laughs> moving on to uh, technology, another technology piece. Uh, this is a student pick. Uh, black light effects. They're not just for Halloween anymore. This comes from Roscoe.com and it's by Joel. No last name. Just Joel. <laughs> uh, and basically this article uh, uh, talks about how um, black light, you know, usually it's used as a, a, for cheesy effects in, in haunted houses and whatnot, but now they've found it's, it's being used more to 
to create a backlight effect and change time of day on, on uh, backdrops. Mm -hmm. yeah, what do you guys think? I think it's really cool. I mean, this it isn't a new revolutionary idea. It's just a revolutionary product because black lights usually are like they're huge. The wildfire fixtures are huge. They weigh so much. And, and this these one are like, was, like cubes. This yeah, this little tiny cube. Yeah. Yeah, it was like three pounds or something, which is insane for a light with that much power. Um, and I mean, I've used UV lights for effects like that before in a show. We but the thing is, you have to use it with UV paint. Mm. in order to make it work. And UV paint is mad expensive, mm -hmm. especially when you're painting 30 by 50 drop. UV paint comes in like little tiny cans. Mm -hmm. You need like a hundred of them to cover a drop. And mm -hmm. So it's a really cool effect, but I don't know how practical it ends up being because if you look to the photos on the article... Yeah, which the by the way, UNCSA students... I know, I saw that. Shout out to my the, alma mater. The backdrop was only like three yeah. feet by two feet, and then the, like there was one light that lit that, and they're like, oh, look how powerful it is. But if you take that across a 30 foot by 50 foot drop, how many pictures do you actually need to get that effect? I also thought we were looking... <laughs> this is really nitpicky. Um, I thought we were looking at it from a backlit screen because we all read it on our computers. Uh, you know what I mean? That that influences it a little bit. Well, you can Doesn't see it? the but I mean, the, yeah, the change. The contrast. I, mean, I think um, the idea is to be able to paint one thing and get like starkly different looks out of it. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say though, I don't. I mean, you know, I'm sorry, but I didn't think that those paintings were all that great. Like the, the execution <laughs> of them I mean, has nothing to do with your school, but like I'm sure there's I'm sure there's like, great ways to use it, but those weren't necessarily like I wouldn't necessarily want to see that on. Stage. I'm not sure. Well, also, we backdrops are such like a thing of another era now. Yeah. They're starting to come back around though. Yeah. We used yeah. it um, in a production I worked on of Guys and Dolls, where we kind of had it set in um, a, in a thrift store, and um, for the very end, <clears throat> we just we had one black, we had one line of this UV paint um, outlining a cityscape like, across mm -hmm. yeah. the backdrop, of it. and so at the very end, the black lights came on and kind of revealed it, and that was kind of cool. Um, well, and of course, there's there's pretty notable, sh like very successful shows that use it. Blue Man Group, like mm -hmm. they, yeah, they use the heck out of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, uh, mm -hmm. maybe Blackbite it on seems, those blue faces. I mean, I haven't seen that since yeah. like 1992, so I'm not sure <laughs> it still reads all right. But it probably just reads like it's 1992. <laughs> well, maybe just fine. It's Sabrina <laughs> Trotter, you right? Me, <laughs> there is the danger of black lights looking cheesy or pushing a show in a non-realistic direction. So heaven I, forbid! I know, I know, <laughs> heaven forbid. So I would be excited to use them in a way where they added to a show as opposed to overshadowing it. And I think that's exactly what the article yeah. was talking about, where like you can use UV paint where you don't see it on the front light, but as soon as you put UV, it changes all the colors. Like It's not so, cheesy because you can still make it look realistic. It just makes it look like a sunrise, a sunset, a normal day. Well, it's interesting we, with Laetol coming up, right now we're dealing with uh, this painting sort of technique that Jesse's trying to achieve where um, the panels are painted one way with the front light and then when they get shown through through the back there's a whole different type of painting maybe I'm giving it away oh, I don't know but there's a whole <laughs> style of painting that like pops through from the back side of the muslin and I wonder if there isn't like something you know there's something in you know to that in this in this uh, technology mm -hmm. Well, moving on, tell us about this neat new laser cutter. You know, I just think I'm the perfect person to talk about this. <laughs> because, well, you know, I actually have used a laser cutter, so yeah. this oh, is good. Good. Me, good. I like we're better than you. But yes, okay, constructible, interactive laser cutting. This is by James Hobson for Hackaday.com, and it is a student pick. And basically, there is this new product, the Human Computer Interaction Group from the Hasso Platner Institute has made kind of like a drafting table where you draw with like laser pointers and then it turns them into like precise drawings which the laser cutter then cuts out. Yeah. So as opposed to like putting like a CAD or a yeah. thing into the laser cutter and then it just doing it automatically. Um, so yeah, then there's like a really That's cool seven minute friendly. video yeah. showing yeah, how this works. The opposite. I think I it looks like a huge terrible learning user. curve. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I think you have to like study that machine yeah. to be able to use it effectively. Because the thing well, she was doing in order to like make it draw a circle, she wasn't drawing a circle over. She was like doing a specific movement with the laser that the software interpreted as a circle. Like, yeah, like there were like so twenty different pins or something. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and you pointed out that um, on the comments that they had like sped up the video. Yeah. So it's yeah. going to actually be taking uh, a lot longer than... That seemed like a, a little dirty of a trick to me. Yeah, I didn't notice that until the second time I just thought it looked it. like fun. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, and exactly, right? Yeah. It looks like total, It looks like super fun, but I just don't know how... 
you know, something like that, it's, it's supposed to be useful as a prototyping tool, I think, yeah. and then that's what the laser cutter is amazingly good at, and I use it every day for that purpose, pretty much. Right. Um, but I don't think I would want to use that type. It, it actually, it's, it's trying to be really open and creative, but it, it feels really restrictive, like the way they've yeah. actually set up the interface. And I wonder how you actually have to, like, do you interact with the software in order to set it up with what scale you want to be? Because if you're just drawing a rectangle, like if your hand sways a little bit, how does it know where you want that line in order to be so precise in what you're making? Uh, yeah, room for revision. <laughs> I feel like if you get to make the CAD drafting and then put it in the, yep. and then put it in the laser cutter, you have, there's a distinct like window of time that you have to stop and correct what you're doing. Whereas this, I wasn't, I wasn't sure that that was. You just draw it. You just draw it, and then it goes. Away, yeah. Yeah. And there's no room for you to kind of stand back and look and acknowledge, and be like, okay, I like that. Okay, I want to change that. Okay. Well, and the progress. other thing is, I always do. I always print out what I'm going to print on regular cheap paper first, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that I can see that it's going where I want it to, and making the shape that I want it to. And then I load my expensive materials in, and then that because the program is repeatable, you just say, right. do that same thing again. I don't know that that's possible with this, so that if you yeah. draw a circle, you're doing it on this thing you spent $40 a sheet on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, that doesn't you, sound very... Yeah, and I mean, think one of these bad boys costs. Wouldn't you have to make, like, a CAD drawing or a hand drawing of what you wanted before you went into the room anyway? Yeah. Like, I wouldn't want to go on a laser cutter and, like, start well, sketching not, my ideas we're not out. Artists, but is, I mean, <laughs> isn't, the point, isn't the point of, like, drawing something by hand that it has the, like, the feel and the imprecision and all of that, and then mm -hmm. this just turns it into what you'd do on CAD anyway, right? Uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a few there's a few scenic designers here who don't like to use the laser cutter. Mm -hmm. they, like Chris, he, he likes to do it all by hand. Yeah, yeah. way too. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, personal. I'm all about the short comments today. All right. Luke, Luke Foco, this is cool, but not a game changer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, totally Luke. Fair. <laughs> Well, uh, this, this next article, it was all over Deadspin a couple weeks ago. It's, it's, it's kind of funny and sad at the same time. Take it away, this, Jess. This article just aggravated me so much. Uh, it's called Nugget, Nugget's Mascot Rocky Collapsed After Being Lowered from Rafters While Motionless. It's an editor pick from nba.sportsillustrated.com by Ben Golliver. And basically, this mascot in, um, I don't even know what sporting event it was. It was basketball, basketball, basketball Denver players. Nuggets. It was yeah. a pre-show uh, event into the, the basketball game, and they were going to lower the mascot from the ceiling in a harness, and basically the guy passed out while in the harness, and so yeah. they lowered his like, limp, lifeless suit. body to the ground, and as soon as he hit the ground, he just went down because he was unconscious. <laughs> and so you know, everyone's like, oh, this is so scary. How did this happen? But there were a lot of safety oversights that went to that that outcome, I feel. The video is so sad. Just, uh, <laughs> it's really, it's like, <laughs> you guys come, oh, this. something's wrong. <laughs> so, I, mean, it, it, um, I, I have never heard of suspension trauma. Uh, I mean, yeah. until coming to school here, I've, I've heard about it a lot. Um, a lot, mostly on the green page. Um, but yeah, I'd never heard of that as like a thing that you had to worry about. I mean, not that I go hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just for us lay people, what is suspension trauma? Suspension trauma is when if you're in a harness, it, the way it has to be so tight around your legs and around all of your arteries in order um, to keep you safe, it cuts off blood circulation, and it um, prevents oxygen from making to your brain. And so that's what made him pass out, was he wasn't getting enough oxygen to his brain. And you but couple that with the hot suit that he's yeah, in, too. Yeah, and the yeah. problem with that is that it takes about 15 to 20 minutes of being completely motionless in a harness for that to effect to start to take place, for you to be able to start feeling dizzy and lightheaded and start seeing warning signs. And you can actually die from it because you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain. So if you don't realize and you pass out and you don't realize you're not feeling well and someone isn't there to yeah. get you down, it can turn right. into a serious situation. So some, it sounds like they put him up there for kind of yeah, I mean, that's over awesome. and It sounds like whoever decided, oh, we'll put him in a harness, never actually looked into the safety behind it. And right. it sounded like from the article that the people in charge were kind of trying to say that, oh, he had just passed out once he got to the bottom. Like, he had collapsed once he got to the bottom. It was like, no, you watch him going down. And he's like, he's, he, he's, he's been passed out for a while. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, this is so lethargic. What is he, a squirrel or something? <laughs> something like that. Right I mean, is it, is it me? But like, I kind of thought, oh, well, if he's passed out and he's in this harness, the fastest way to get him medical attention is to go ahead and bring him down and lower him in. I'm sorry, it's part of the show, and other people have to see it, but. Wouldn't that make sense? I don't think they even knew, though. I think yeah, they were just bringing him in on with you. Yeah. 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 He should have been yeah. calmed. He should have been all sorts of things. Like, yeah. usually, if you're going to have somebody 
standing by to do that sort of effect. You have a platform for them so they can yeah, be standing and then... Yeah. 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 So it made me wonder, like, who are stage managers at NBA events? Yeah. Like, who are the yeah. people that make those decisions that? and who sort of manage that aspect of the production I'm of sure an NBA? I'm sure there's got to be an events company there's or gonna something. Be, yeah, there's got to be somebody, because there's so many cameras and people are like, camera one, camera two, go, go. Yeah, yeah, there's got to be so many. Well, I mean, yeah, you've got your TV production, right. but like all the light shows and everything, someone's yeah, got to be live. Well, do you know anybody shows? who's gone into like sporting event? I feel like all people I know in sports are doing are doing sports journalism and sports yeah. broadcast. But if you think about a sporting event, there's so much stuff that goes on besides the t television broadcast. Absolutely. You know, they have those like prize launch things, it's all and spectacle. like the Boy Scouts yeah. come out with their like little troop and they carry the flags, and then you know, yeah, cheerleaders and yep. you know the mascots, and then you got people handing out prizes, and you've got the little. The little race car things where like they pick three audience members and then trivia. I mean, there's there's so the much stuff. Pierogi race. The pierogi. Yeah. <laughs> the pierogi race. Yeah. That's one of the things that this article is bringing up was how much is too much That's when it comes to uh, a pre-show event for a sporting game. No, it's fine. Um, Jenny, one of our commenters, said, um, "I actually think having a pre-show game." or sorry, pre-show before the game is completely fine. It gets the audience pumped and excited, but what needs to be clear, though, is that a sports pre-show, like any other performance, needs to be properly rehearsed, which is totally true. I think if you're going to make such a spectacle out of this, it needs to be at the level of that <coughs> spectacle anywhere else. Our, and you got to figure they don't rehearse this stuff. Yeah. I'm would sure you, they, would you, I don't know. I think they do. do. They, you don't think they rehearse I the Super Bowl halftime show? You well, don't think that, they of course oh, they do, but okay, obviously, but like, now, stuff like fair. this. The Super Bowl halftime show, we know they don't always get a rehearsal in. I mean, it's it's proven. We've looked back through the records. We've known people who have worked on those. They don't always get to rehearse those things. So it's just live events. It's like one shot. You get it. You get it and well, you, know, you just figure happens. the facilities are being used all that day for warm-ups and practice and whatnot. So I imagine it... It's difficult to get in. The lesson practice. sports needs to take some lessons from theater. There you go. Yeah. And cool. said yeah, it. Yeah. And that ends this segment of the News from the Real World podcast. Join us for segment two.